uh, it really is about this, uh, <laughs> this really broken family uh, and how God uh, never gave up on them. You know, you have the, the big story of redemption and, you know, the Jews need to get to Egypt and Joseph goes before them and, uh, you know, and God's going to protect them there so they can grow from a family to a tribe to a nation to bring them back in the land to fulfill the promise and bring the Messiah. So you have that big picture, but uh, it's good to know that God works in the lives of individuals to accomplish that big picture. And one of them has been Joseph. Joseph's this guy that we admire. Uh, he's been able to uh, suffer slavery, imprisonment, false accusations, and so forth, and still believe that God's with him. God has a plan. Uh, God's going to uh, bring his dreams to pass and so forth. He'll see his brothers again. He'll see his fathers, and he hangs on to that. And there's no bitterness, and he's forgiven his brothers. And we admire Joseph for all of that, and because he does that, we see through his action, God then is able to work through the life of his rotten family, <laughs> his murderous brothers that sold him into slavery. And uh, uh, I think it's just a great, uh, a great story and can be a great encouragement to all of us that, uh, man, if somebody will take a stand for the Lord and trust God and walk with them, that person can uh, radically impact uh, those uh, in their own family. And uh, and certainly in uh, those in their own uh, uh, sphere of influence. Well, let's jump in. There's a plan to frame Benjamin. That's how this all comes about. Remember the, the brothers when we left them, they're whooping it up, having a pretty good time there with Joseph uh, there. They don't know his identity yet. Uh, they just know that they've been able to get grain. They're going to be able to take back to Canaan, save their families. Uh, they've been reunited with Simeon, who's been held there for two years uh, and now uh, everything is good. Uh, when uh, Joseph seats them at that dinner, remember, this is playing through their mind, he is able to seat them from the, the youngest right down to the oldest, and they're a little mystified about how he's able to pull that off. That plays into uh, part of our, our story this morning. Uh, and then, of course, there was that little precursor test. This is the big one, but the precursor was he gives Benjamin five times the amount of food uh, that the other brothers have to see, is there still any seeds of jealousy and envy uh, in their hearts? Because Benjamin is his replacement. You know, he's the favored son. What happened to the favored son? <laughs> the big brother sold him into slavery. Now you've got Rachel's other son, his younger uh, brother, Benjamin. What would be his fate? He's glad to know that he's alive. He's seen him, but how will the brothers deal with him? He's forgiven his brothers, but can he be reconciled with him? We can forgive people, and we should forgive people who have wronged us and sinned against us. But it's another issue to be reconciled because there has to be repentance and a change of heart on that other person. And Joseph is trying to find that out, and it's an amazing uh, story of transformation. Well, again, the plan, verse uh, 1, And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sack with food as much as they can carry and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest uh, in his grain uh, money. So he did according to the word of, that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys, and they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off. Joseph said to the steward, get up, follow the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? Is this not the one uh, from which my Lord drinks and with which he indeed practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. So he overtook them and he spoke to them these same words. And they said to him, why does my Lord say such uh, these words? Far be it from us that your servant should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of, the mouth of our sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die. And we also will be my Lord's slaves. And he said, now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave, and you shall be blameless. Then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground, and each opened his sack. So he searched. He began with the oldest and let, left off with the youngest and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes. Each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. 
So uh, going, the plan is, uh, uh, certainly includes this idea of what he did before when they came down to Egypt the first time, taking the money they used to buy the grain, putting it back in the mouth of the sack. They discover it later, and they're, they don't think they won the lottery. They think, this is bad. He accuses us of being spies. He could accuse us of being thieves, and they don't really know what's going on. Joseph, again, does it to kind of play with their heads a bit, uh, and uh, all to lead to this discourse coming up here by Judah. Uh, but does it again, but this time includes a silver cup placed uh, in the bag with, uh, with Benjamin. The steward runs out there. I'm not sure if his first name was Jimmy or not, but the steward runs out there. Just had to throw that in. Uh, and here they are, again, accused of a false accusation. They haven't done it. Uh, they are framed. Uh, and sometimes that's uh, the way life is. Uh, he says, why would you repay evil for good? And, of course, that wasn't uh, true at all. Sometimes, though, in life, we are accused falsely of things that we, uh, we haven't done. I did a survey in the uh, first service, and all of them have been accused of uh, falsely of things they haven't done. Probably that hasn't affected you guys at all. But uh, this is what Jesus says about false accusations in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. He says in, in Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. And I know that's a reaction of most of us when we're being falsely accused and we're just like rejoicing. It's such a blessing. Uh, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Well, again, in that context, it's as a witness for Jesus Christ, because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we're falsely accused, we're ridiculed, we're reviled. Jesus says, if we have that heavenly perspective, we should realize that we are being counted worthy to be in that group of the prophets and so forth that were persecuted before us, the martyrs of the church who have gone before us and suffered for their faith around the world now. We're included in that group, and great will our reward be in heaven. Well, that's quite a perspective to have. And we are accused falsely at times, and we need to have the right perspective about it because, well, this false accusation is given to them to really bring reconciliation with their brother Joseph. Of course, they don't realize that. They don't know what God's doing. They don't understand what's taking place. They're just kind of ticked off. And, uh, and basically, uh, you know, it's like they take their sacks and speedily put them to the ground. It's like, I'll show you. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the kind of uh, thing you get from, uh, from Reuben and these guys. It's like, uh, and, uh, and we see they're, they're arguing over this with the, the steward, you know. Hey, uh, uh, us, we would never do such a thing. Notice their response in verse 7. Why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants should, should do such a thing. Now keep in mind, these are the guys who are the mass murderers, uh, committed incest and all these other wonderful things. Are said, oh, us? You would accuse us of, of stealing? How could, you, how could you accuse us of, uh, of something like, uh, like that? Now, they try to, Judah, you try to use a little logic here in verse 8. He says, look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks. In other words, yeah, we found this extra money. We weren't supposed to have it, so we brought it back, and we're right up front, we gave it back to you. Do thieves usually do that? Uh, I don't think a thief would usually do that. He gets money he's not supposed to have. I think he's going to kind of just hang on to it. See, we're not really thieves. He's trying to use a, a, a little logic here. And then they jump in with, uh, with people, uh, what people do that normally have a very guilty conscience, these brothers have a guilty conscience. They have a very guilty conscience. We've already seen that in a previous study. We actually called it the grace of guilt because God is working in their hearts. And they're feeling it still because of what they did to their brother Joseph. Look at verse 9. With whomever uh, of your servants it is found, let him die. And we will also be my Lord's <laughs> servants. That's like a little over the top. Okay, we got a stolen cup here. Okay, well, I'd say whoever's got that cup should die. And the rest of us, we'll just be your slaves forever. You know, and so a little, little over, a little overreaction. You know, it's like the, uh, uh, the little kid with uh, chocolate chip uh, stuff smeared all over his face. And there's something uh, mentioned of a cookie jar. I don't know what you're talking, cookie jar? I don't know what you're, you know, and there's just the, the guilt is, uh, is there. And uh, these guys are... Uh, a little over the top with their response. And, and fortunately, the, the steward says, uh, basically, that uh, won't be required. You know, we're not going to, no one's going to die for this, but the one who has the cup will become a slave. Now, the plan, again, includes, secondly, not only the money in their sacks, but uh, Joseph's silver cup in the sack of Benjamin. 
Silver, of course, was uh, valuable in, in that day as it is in ours, but uh, this is a personal possession of, of Joseph. Uh, but it's more than that. Uh, it's this idea that Joseph carefully calculates everything. Again, what does he accuse the brothers of when he first sees them? They show up, they're there to buy grain. He shows up and it's like, oh my goodness, you guys are speaking Hebrew. One, two, three, four. They're the right ages. Kind of looks in a little bit. That's my brother standing there. So what does he accuse them of? You're spies. Where does he get that? That's what they accused him of. When he comes out to check up on them and see how they're doing on that errand from his father, then ends up getting him sold into slavery. They say, there comes that dreamer. He's come again to spy on us. Uh, it's all just to say, Joseph isn't winging it. This is all very, very calculated. Uh, one Jewish writer puts it this way, uh, but its use here in terms of the silver involved Joseph's personal recollection that his brothers had sold him into slavery for 20 pieces of silver so that now he harasses and tests them with silver uh, itself. But there's more than that. It's not just silver. It's a silver cup used for divination. So, you know, sometimes we read this about Joseph. And we go, hey, <laughs> I thought he was the, uh, uh, you know, he was the godly young man. And so what's, what's this involvement here and what's going on? Well, the simple explanation is just that. If you were an Egyptian ruler, you were given and you had in your possession a silver cup used for divination. He is an Egyptian ruler. He's got one in the house. He's going to use it. <laughs> and he's going to use it to kind of mess with these guys and find out where, where they're really at and uh, make them wonder who he, really, uh, he, who he really is. He just does it simply to freak them out. Uh, and again, the text really never says as we go on that he actually used it. It just says he might have, uh, but we don't believe that he did. The search begins again with the oldest to the youngest. Reuben's bag is open first. And Mr. Stewart, he found nothing there. And of course, uh, you know, none of these guys are expecting to be caught at all. The ex-con Simeon's bag is then opened with the same results, then Levi, then Judah. You know, and of course, every time that uh, one of them is found not without it, it's kind of like, see, we, we told you so kind of a thing. Then you've got the sons of the concubines, Dan and Naphtali, then Gad and Asher. Uh, again, no silver cup. Eight of them are now can stand uh, self-righteous before the steward. Then Ishakar, Zebulun, they passed the test. Now it's down to Benjamin, and they all pretty much know. If they were kind of wondering about the other brothers, like, <laughs> you know, I sure hope none of those other idiots took this thing when nobody was looking. Uh, if you're, this is the kind of the family here. Uh, but they know one thing for sure. There's no way. There's no way that Benjamin did it. And then to their horrifying amazement, he lifts the silver cup uh, out of uh, Benjamin's bag. Uh, notice their response. It speaks uh, volumes, though their response was silence. No recorded words. In verse 13, they just simply tore their clothes. And again, rending or tearing the clothes in the Middle East. And that time, through the days of Jesus, some parts of the Middle East today, uh, and certainly still part of some aspect of Judaistic culture, is this idea of tearing your clothes. Because you're saying, my heart's just been torn. It could be grief over a loss of a loved one. Uh, but in this case, uh, it's because of the discovery that now, now something might happen to, uh, to Benjamin. So something very different uh, is taking place. Uh, these are these brothers that before could care less about Joseph. Keep in mind, Benjamin is the Joseph replacement. Joseph is the favored son of Rachel, uh, the favored wife of Jacob, and Joseph's been removed. Benjamin now is his younger brother that grows up. He's the Joseph replacement. Joseph, when he first sees him and Benjamin's not there, he's not even sure if the guy's dead or not. He's not sure if the brothers did the same thing to him that they had done to him. He has no idea that even though he's forgiven them, where are their hearts out? You know, if they're still the same way, there's not going to be any reconciliation. And all of these things have been done for a test, but there's a, certainly a change here. Not the same men uh, that he knew 20 years ago. God is working in their hearts. And this idea of tearing their garments over the thought of something happening to Benjamin speaks volumes. Psalm 34, 18 speaks of this idea. And what it says, the Lord is near those who have a broken heart and saves such as a contrite spirit. Uh, you know, when, when you're this broken, that's really when we're probably the closest to the Lord. And when we're just humble before him and 
when we see our need for him the most. And these guys, well, they're going to bring God into the conversation. And they realize that this is all about God and all about their relationship with God. And God is orchestrating the events to bring this about because of the guilt that they have, because of the sin that they've committed. And they're broken before the Lord. And that's a good thing. Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 57, 15 says, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God says, that's, that's who I want to be with. That's who I want to strengthen. That's who I want to comfort. That's who I want around me. Uh, those that have a humble spirit and a contrite heart. And that's kind of where these guys are at. Well, the plot thickens here. There's a plan to frame Benjamin. Now there's a verdict that's going to be pronounced over them in verse 14 to 17. So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, and he was still there. And they fell before him on the ground, and Joseph said to them, What deed is this you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly, uh, can certainly practice divination? He could. It's not saying he does. <laughs> he could. Then Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. But he said, far be it from me that I should do so. The man in whose cup, in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, go up in peace to your father. So before the verdict is pronounced, we'd say the brothers are there bowing once again. This is the third occasion to remember the first time uh, when they come for grain. J again, Joseph is, is the viceroy, the prime minister, and they see him and they bow down to the, to the ground. Not the fulfillment of the dream because not all the brothers are there. But when they come back the second time and they bring Benjamin as per his instructions to prove that they're not spies, and they bring him and they all bow before him, prostrate on the ground, then that is the fulfillment of the dream that God gave him when he was a, 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 young, a young teenager. Uh, and here it happens again. And certainly this idea of the dream certainly comes back to Joseph. I, I, very, uh, I doubt very greatly these guys are putting the, this together. Uh, Joseph has been so clever in his uh, disguise and always speaking Egyptian, always using a translator, uh, and, and even throwing in this idea that he may be practicing divination. Uh, this would all just kind of uh, think to their minds, there's no way that this guy could possibly be Joseph. But he turns up the heat a little bit in verse 15 when he says, What deed is this you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice uh, divination? Now again, divination is forbidden later in Israel. Uh, uh, in Leviticus 19.26, Deuteronomy 18.10, uh, 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 and all this stuff, the idea of uh, encounters with the dead and speaking and channeling and all this stuff, uh, very much condemned. Again, it never says that Joseph actually does this. I think he does it to kind of play with their minds a bit. Uh, I don't think he's reading tea leaves at all. In fact, Isaiah the prophet says one of the reasons God condemns Egypt later is because of their involvement in, uh, in divination. Uh, but he wants them to know that the fix is in. He wants them to think that he knows things that, uh, uh, that uh, he should not possibly be able to know. He's this mystery person. How can he do this? How can he seat them in order from the oldest to the youngest? Who can do that with, with uh, uh, all of these, uh, all these uh, 11 brothers? I mean, what are the odds of, of that? And they've got to be kind of considering this. It's like, we're going to address this guy. We're going to appeal this guy for mercy. How are we going to get out of this? This guy knows us forwards and backwards. He's probably practicing uh, divination. It's, uh, it's very interesting what uh, the whole play and what Joseph is doing here. It's brilliant. Uh, notice the verdict also before it's pronounced. Uh, Judah says that they're guilty before God. Here's, here's the real turning point. And again, if there's a, a key verse... Although the plea by, uh, by Judah in the end is amazing. But, but the turning point here is in verse 16. Judah says, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found the iniquity of your servants. God? <laughs> well, this is about a silver cup in Joseph. Uh, he's the guy that practices divination. They're like, nah, it doesn't matter. I mean, and, and were they guilty of it? No, it was a false accusation. But they were guilty. <laughs> they were guilty. They were guilty of so many things. 
They were guilty of selling Joseph into slavery. They were guilty of the murder of others. They were guilty of so many things. And they said, whatever is going on in our life, this is so weird. It's so strange. How does this guy know this? There's no way. We promised we'd bring Benjamin back. He's the only guy with the cup. God is all over this. Man, our situation is with God. That's who we've got to deal with. Our problem is with the Lord. He sees everything. He's known everything. These are guys that could care less about the Lord uh, only a few years before. Uh, the NIV puts it this way. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. Uh, yeah, we're guilty. Uh, not of what you think, uh, but we're absolutely guilty. And then before the verdict also, Judah says that all the brothers are willing to do us over the same fate. Wow. Wow. This is a little different. It's like, uh, you know, listen, if you, if you keep Benjamin, we're all staying. If he's going to be your slave, we're all staying. Now, what did, the, what did Mr. Stewart say? He said, listen, uh, you know, no one's going to die here. Whoever's got the silver cup, he's going to be a slave. Everybody else will be considered blameless. What does Joseph say to him? He says, yeah, that's right. Whoever's got the silver cup is going to be the slave. You guys go in shalom. You go in peace back to your father. And they're, these brothers, these brothers are going, no way. That's our brother. We're not going anywhere without him. If he's your slave, we're all your slaves. We're sticking together. That's just a little bit different. <laughs> That's a little different than these guys. They grow up with different moms, same dad, different moms. Uh, and they don't exactly get along. Uh, a lot of envy, a lot of jealousy among themselves besides uh, what they feel towards uh, Joseph. Uh, and the fact they were willing to sell him into slavery. Look at, at the end of verse 16. He says, here we are, my Lord's slave, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. If somebody's going down, we're all going down together. There has never been this kind of brotherly, fraternal love in these guys' hearts ever before. I'd say God's working. I think Joseph is seeing, wow, God is working in their lives. But he kind of plays it out a little more. And the verdict is pronounced, and it's all for a test. Verse 17, far be it from me that I should do so. The man in whose the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, go up in peace to your father. Everything rested on, on Benjamin. Now what's amazing about this, and it sure took a lot to get to this point. But, but uh, Joseph has so cleverly arranged all the circumstances that now he's placed Benjamin in the same place he was in. You got the same brothers, and uh, here's Joseph. Do we sell him into slavery? And we go free. And they do. They sell him into slavery. Now he's got Benjamin sold into slavery because of the crime he's committed, he's been found guilty of, and the rest of you can go free. Will you go free? See, it's, it's, it's just amazing how he's able to turn the whole table. It, it took a couple years. It took 17 years of waiting and trusting the Lord. This is like 20 years later, uh, just about. But uh, he's able to pull it, pull it off. The lure for them was their liberty. I mean, they're saying, we'll stay and be a slave, all of us, the rest of our lives. Now, with Joseph, they went, should we, uh, should we uh, sell him into slavery? Yeah, we'll get 20 pieces of silver. Sounds good to us. And while he's screaming bloody murder, again, we read from the Psalms, He's screaming for his life. His brothers are sitting there eating their lunch. And then they take the 20 pieces of silver. And now they're saying, rather than let our brother be sold into slavery, we'll all be slaves the rest of our lives. I would say that was a transformation. And, uh, and Joseph is certainly sensing that. So the plan is to frame Benjamin. It's for the purpose of testing his brothers one last time. The plant, the silver cup, uh, in his sack, the verdict is pronounced against that Benjamin, and, uh, and uh, we see a real change, a different reaction in the lives of the brothers. And then we get to kind of the climax of this whole thing before the big reveal, which won't be till next week. But in verses 18 to 24, the final plea reveals the heart of Judah. And uh, this is amazing as we'll read it and then kind of analyze it together. Verse 18, then Judah came near and said to him, and I just want to say, to kind of set the stages, you know, if we get arrested and, and charged falsely for a crime, you know, we're going to, uh, we're going to 
hopefully uh, somebody's going to come pay our, our bail. We're going to get the best attorney we can get and so forth. That, that ain't happening here. Uh, there's no attorneys. There, there's no appeal. There's no nothing. That guy can just say, kill him, and he's executed. There, nothing. So when Judah says, can I, have a, can I speak with you now? He's basically saying, I realize you may kill me for this, but I'm going to have a shot at it anyway. So, you know, this is a big deal what Judah is doing here. They've already kind of made their case, and this guy, the Lord of Egypt, has spoken, but he's going to give it one more shot, even if it cost him his life. So important to see the context. Then Judah came near and said to him, O oh Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing. And do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age who is young. His brother is dead, and he alone is left with his mother's children. His father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And uh, we said to my Lord, the, la the lad cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. In other words, no more food. So it was, when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down. For we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me, and I said, surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. But if you take this one also from me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray head, hair with sorrow to the grave. Now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us since his life is bound up in the lad's life. It will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers, for how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. It's, uh, it's quite a plea. And the first thing he does is he kind of rehearses the little family history and how they all came about. You know, there was the famine and they needed to come down. Uh, Joseph interviews them. He asks them a question. He's the one that asks about uh, uh, their father. He asks about and discovers they have a younger brother. He's the one that says, uh, uh, you know, you can't come again. You can never get any more food in the midst of this uh, terrible uh, drought and everything. Uh, you'll have to starve to death unless you bring that younger brother. And he kind of re re rehearses the, uh, the whole thing. Uh, and, and notice the order of the plea. Recites the history uh, behind Benjamin's presence there. He predicts what would happen if Benjamin is not allowed to, uh, to return. You know, it's going to kill the father. Uh, you know, because, you know, yeah, we've got different mothers, but we've got one father. Uh, and uh, and this, uh, this son that he loves is the son of his old age. Not only that, he had a brother, but, but he's been torn to pieces. He's not with us. And he goes through the, here's all the reasons why uh, you've got to uh, allow us. He speaks of his older father, the child of his old age, the son that was lost, the love between the father and the son. And he's probably in a lot of emotion, a lot of tears pouring this out. Uh, he doesn't know how this thing ends up. He doesn't know who, who he's talking to. He doesn't know if he's going to get killed on the spot for even addressing and saying these things. And then he respectfully implicates Joseph. Very interesting strategy. Basically says, you know, you're part of the problem here. Because you're the one that said we could not come back unless we brought him. That's the only reason he's here. If you hadn't said that, we wouldn't be in this predicament. He's very respectful, but he implicates Joseph, the Lord of Egypt, in this whole thing with him. Uh, and then he recounts the father's fear of losing Benjamin, explains the dilemma. We wanted to come back. Our father wouldn't let us because you said we couldn't come. We had to beg him. We had to plea and so forth. Uh, he mentions the fact that he's already lost one son, a brother torn to pieces by wild animals, 
And if he doesn't bring back Benjamin, their father will die. Pretty good, pretty good plea. Joseph listens to all this, and he gains, well, vital insight information he hasn't heard, didn't know for 20 years. Uh, he learns that his father was heartbroken when he left. I mean, you might assume that. I mean, we assume that Joseph had a good uh, relationship with Jacob and so forth. But now he hears it for the first time. Because Judah quotes Jacob when he says, uh, Jacob said, surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. And, uh, and again, those are words that uh, echoed in the conscience of Judah and his brothers all of those uh, years. And, uh, and Judah, of course, had no idea how this revelation was affecting the guy standing before him because he doesn't know that it's Joseph. He also learns that Joseph and his brothers now speak very differently about this issue of favoritism. That was the issue, right? I mean, they're, they're, you know, you've got Leah, Judah's mother's Leah. Is she the loved wife? She's the unloved wife. There's my father, and he doesn't love my mother. Uh, and he doesn't care much for me and my brothers. Uh, and we're kind of the older guys. We're not real thrilled about that. And then, uh, then he marries Rachel. Uh, and then they're, they're unable to have kids. So now we've got uh, their maidservants, you know, come into it. And then they have kids. Now we've got more brothers. It's not one big happy family going on here. Uh, and then finally, Rachel conceives and gives Joseph. And Joseph's the heir apparent. He gets the, the special robe that means I'm going to be called shots. I'm going to be the Luna one day. I'll be in charge of this whole thing. He's just kind of a young, young kid. And then he has these dreams and everyone's going to bow before him. And they can't stand him. Now, it's very interesting, given that, that he uses the argument of the favoritism as a reason why they should return uh, Benjamin back. Because they've come to the conclusion that they don't care anymore. They love their father and they don't care. And they love that, uh, that younger brother now, unlike they ever loved Joseph, and they don't care. He means so much to us. And he's favored. He doesn't say like, yeah, we hate his guts because he's favored. He says, we love him. We love our father, and that's his favorite kid. We've got to get him back because we love our father. This is, this is all very, very different. I mean, just kind of put it in a, uh, you know, where we live every day, contemporary kind of context. If, if you were born into a family and your father did not like your mother and treated her terribly, and you had a couple of uh, brothers and maybe a sister, and then your father, who treated her terribly and treated you terribly, then runs off and marries another gal who he's supposedly uh, madly in love with and has a couple of kids by, uh, how, do you, how do you look to them? And then you're all raised in this context of your father favoring them against you your whole life. Uh, you're kind of ticked because of the way he's treated you, if you love your mother, you're kind of ticked because of the way he treated her. That's these guys. But now they go, we don't care about that. We don't care about how we were raised. We don't care about what our father did. We love him. He's our father. We love him. And we love this kid right here. And I'll give my life for him right now. That's, that's quite a transformation. That's quite a transformation. They'd come to terms with the whole thing of the favoritism. They'd come to terms with the hatred uh, of their own, their own mother. And then notice also he takes a pledge of full responsibility for the life of Benjamin. Verse 30, he says, Now therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad's not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety. I made a pledge in my life. For the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I will bear the blame before my father forever. It's quite a, quite a change. He says, not only is the favoritism not an issue, because we don't really care anymore. He goes, I promised that, that I would be completely responsible for Benjamin. Uh, and if I don't bring him back, I will bear the shame myself forever before my father. This is a different guy that sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. God has been tremendously uh, working in their lives. And again, let's, let's recap <laughs> who these guys were. Sons number two and three were Simeon and Le Levi. Uh, they had conceived and executed uh, a genocide against the Shemanites. 
uh, and then after they, they kill all the male in that city, uh, and they stand covered in blood before their father, and he's like, what have you done to us? They went, well, he shouldn't have treated our sister like a prostitute. Oh, that's a real justification there. Uh, these are the guys we're talking about. Then you got Reuben, who's the oldest, who committed incest with his father's uh, wife, Bila, so that he could kind of usurp the father's authority and gain this status over the other brothers. Uh, that's big brother uh, Reuben. Uh, and then you've got uh, the guy that just made this address here, Judah. Judah, who hangs with, remember, his Canaanite buddy. So he's going to this pagan festival, and along the way, he sees a Canaanite prostitute, so he has a relationship with her, except it turns out later it wasn't a Canaanite prostitute. That was his son's, deceased son's wife. And she reveals that later when she's pregnant, and he's ready to burn her at the stake because she's pregnant out of wedlock. Just a little bit hypocritical. That's the guy that just made that speech. Pretty, pretty amazing stuff. These are pretty hardened guys. And what I want to say is that this all comes about because one kid said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live for the Lord, and I'm going to trust God no matter what. No matter what bad things happen to me, no matter what I have to go through, God's with me. He's got a plan. I'm just going to wait and see and see how it all works out. And I'm not going to get bitter. I'm not going to become cynical. He goes through a lot, and it ends up impacting. Well, his father last week, we saw that Jacob... Uh, but the brothers here. Third, Judah offers to replace again his life for the life of Benjamin. He will substitute himself, which becomes very interesting because, of course, Jesus is known as what? The lion of the tribe of Judah, who's known as the one who substituted, was willing to substitute his life uh, for another. Dr. Barnhouse uh, uh, relates this this way. He says, uh, here was the uh, eloquence of true love. Love so burningly manifest, so willing to take full responsibility before God. Love which thought only of Jacob and Benjamin melted the heart of Joseph. Such love moved, moved Moses to ask God to blot his name out of the book of life. Such love prompted Paul to wish himself accursed for his brethren. If only they could be saved. Judah was transformed by divine love. When he was born, his name was Praise, because again, his mother Leah was like, <laughs> I give up on Jacob, Lord, I'm just going to trust you. I never will get from him the love uh, and affection that I need, but Lord, I can come to you and I can trust you. So I'm going to name this kid Praise. Uh, and he finally lives up to his name. Now, uh, one of the other cool things about this whole is that Jacob has to hear the whole story later. I mean, he's got to yeah, Dad, you should have heard Judah, man. He was awesome. You should have, what he said, of course, we didn't know it was Joseph, but he risked his life. He said, man, it was, it was awesome. You know, he has to hear the story, and he has to know the details uh, because, uh, wow, when he prophesies over Judah later, he says this in Genesis 49. He's at the end of his life. He's prophesying over his sons and of Judah. He says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver uh, from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. I know that's a little cryptic, but he's basically saying the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is going to come through Judah. Uh, and it's going to happen uh, before we as a people in that established land lose the ability to execute capital punishment. That's, that's it in a nutshell. Could, could Jacob have said this over Judah if this transformation doesn't come about. I, I don't think so. I think it, J, Jacob knows the story. If we're studying about Judah a couple of chapters ago and we flip to chapter 49, we read this and go, eh, that doesn't make sense. Because <laughs> uh, he doesn't have good things to say about all these sons. But this one he does. And I think it's because of what he says here that indicates the real transformation uh, in his life. So I think the, the thing to take away from this is Never underestimate the transforming power of the grace of God. The grace of God. Man, and I just think this story, these guys, <laughs> there's such brokenness, and yet God brings it all together because, yeah, he's, he's working out the big plan of redemption. Jesus has got to come through the Jewish people. He's got to come through Judah. He's got to come through David and so forth. And he's working those things out as he does. He works that out, though, through through the transformation of people's lives who are about doing his business, that he needs to get these guys to Egypt. Of course, 
Joseph is going to be able at the end to say what you meant for evil, God meant for good and the saving of many lives. And, uh, and we need to be able to adopt that same philosophy in our own lives if, if we want to see God work in the lives of maybe the broken families around us. And, uh, and, and there's a few, isn't there? You know, this, this, I, I don't know if you relate to these guys or not in terms of, in terms of family. <clears throat> we went to, Kathy and I went to a family party last night. Missed out on Uncle Tim. Had some older grinds. But uh, it was quite the contrast. And uh, because a couple of weeks ago, we went to a big 50th anniversary Japanese side of the family. And that was, uh, they had really good food. <laughs> awesome food. Really good entertainment. This was the Chinese Hawaiian side of the family. This is a little bit different. Different atmosphere. Charlie will laugh because he knows what I'm talking about. A little different atmosphere over there. But we had, a, we had a great time. But I'm still trying to put together, I'm taking a picture of uh, uh, the cousin, and he's, a, he's only a little older than me, and we've got four generations. He's a great grandfather. Now, I'm a grandfather of a five year old and a two and a half year old and a newborn, right? He's a little older than me, and he's a great grandfather. It's like, I'm trying to figure this out and do the math, and I'm, I take the picture and I sit back down. Now, now who is that? He's married? No, they're not really married. Okay, well, who is that? Well, well, that's the kids from, well, that was from a different marriage. Yeah, you know, no, yeah, but then they had a, no, they weren't married either, but then, you know, and you're and it's like, well, no wonder I can't really kind of get this all straight. Plus everybody, I'm, I'm always the same, but everybody else is always changing through the years, of course, <laughs> and, uh, but it was confusing. And I, I uh, had studied this all week, and I just thought, you know, God could save everyone in this room. You know, that's, that's, that's the point of, uh, of this study. And I think we need to see that and understand that and believe that. It took 20 years, though. It didn't just like, I like that. This week, I'm just going to share the gospel with all my family. I'm pretty sure they'll be saved by the end of the week. Probably not. Maybe some of them will. But this, this took 20 years uh, to work out talk about uh, patient evangelism and, uh, and hanging in there. So I just encourage you to keep praying and keep being an example to those around you. And, and if you're one of the brothers, you've got some deep-seated stuff you've been carrying for a long time, uh, God's watching. He'll keep messing with you through a guy like Joseph or somebody else until you'll finally go, it's me. I'm guilty. I did it. I own it. I accept it. And I have a broken and contrite heart. And Lord, those are the people you'll come to meet with and forgive. He'll, he'll do that as well. Hallelujah. 